Okay, it's recording. Right. Um, I expected uh, more beginner type of um, participants. And also because I had only one week, I, I had one last week, a um, bit of a confusion in the schedule. So it's a lightweight and a, probably a shorter session. Um, but we can discuss more than last time. I think the, the first two sessions uh, I did all the talking. And as I said, it's not meant to be a training course. It's, it's still a training group where we're supposed to discuss things. So um, <clears throat> I'm just going to get going and uh, you can interrupt me at any point and we can discuss further, I mean, more advanced topics. Okay, uh, there we go, okay. So last week there was a, a request to introduce the SKU. So I'm sorry if you are completely familiar with that, but um, that's gonna be the topic. And I will go crescendo uh, in the next sessions. And I actually, I'm only going to talk about the, the vertical SKU for now. As an introduction, uh, you probably know that uh, when Black and Scholes came around in, I think, 73, it, the, the assumption was, of course, a geometric Brownian motion and a flat um, IV across the chain. And things have changed for many reasons. Uh, technology, the 1987 crash. But that said, before then, it was, it was correct. So something has changed in the ecosystem. Um, and also the, the volumes uh, and the electronic trading in the 90s. So a lot of things have changed. So the, 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 the vertical skew or the, the skew, let's, let's just call it as an IV curve, generally follows a convex type of curve. It is not always that way, but because most of us are um, US, op US stock or US indices, index op uh, options traders, um, this is something we are more accustomed to. And um, I think after a while you learn to recognize a skew and this is more uh, uh, typical of a put skew. I mean, after a while you, you realize what a call skew looks like, what a pull, uh, uh, put and a call skew looks like. And <clears throat> as a reminder um, uh, for statisticians, this, this has not much to do with the skew of a, any uh, distribution. Um, although when, when you look into the, um, the mathematics of it, there are some relations, but I mean, we talk, I mean, this is, this is the options jargon, not the stat statistics jargon. <clears throat> so sometimes it's, the skew is called the, the smirk or the smile, all those things are the same thing. What is important to, of course, understand is that the skew is model dependent, uh, uh, Black and Scholes is a closed equation where, where, whereby you can uh, extract the IV from price or calculate a uh, theoretical price from a, an IV is modeled. And the, the shape, the form, the, uh, is very much uh, symbol dependent or at least in some sectors the, the, the skew will look different. Uh, the commodities may be very different. Uh, it's also different in Forex. So when you build, there's some, always a, a warning, or at least, a, 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 yeah, some, I mean, because a lot of people, uh, for example, trade, uh, let's say, an RTT or a Brooklyn Butterfly um, or on SPX or RAT, which b both have well, um, different but still similar uh, dynamics and then they want to apply it on uh, forex or commodities and it doesn't work anymore. Um, um, it's it's Im very important to understand that the, 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 the underlying instrument is actually important. The skew, and I'm not gonna explain why the skew exists, I mean, there are, but look, look, the, the difference, the variation in IV across the options chain is uh, mostly, motivated by um, supply and demand. Um, and there are, there, there can be more demand for hedges on the downside. Uh, and I can come back to what you said. I mean, sometimes when the market falls, it falls hard. And, uh, and you can see that um, um, people will look for hedges, will look for protection. Um, and, and some protection sometimes at some levels, 
but as we're going to see, the, the IV curve is overall fairly easy to model. It's the, the smirk or the smile is very often of the, of the same shape. Um, so there, there are two types of skew. I mean, again, this is uh, an introduction, so let's uh, get things a bit clear. There's the vertical skew and the horizontal skew. Um, I thought I would make a long session and talk about both, but I think today I am not going to mention much about horizontal skew. Also because I want to take things a little bit slower. I think the first two sessions were a bit heavy for some. Um, um, and and lastly, for, on, for, for this slide, um, even though we, we could assume that IV is directional, uh, it is not. IV is uh, the projection or the anticipation of volatility forward. Um, but if you, in, in the model, we can question whether the model is correct or not, but in the model, IV is completely non-directional. So uh, it assumes that there's as much chance the market will go up or down. Uh, it, it is very often a, a misconception that IV is directional, which is not. Um, <clears throat> if I go back to this um, chart, we use the IV as the y-axis or vertical axis, and here we use the, the strikes as the horizontal axis. Um, it is, of course, uh, easier to understand, easier to visualize, and it is something we can, we can easily relate to uh, because the, the, the strikes are discrete numbers across the chain. So, and you then um, figure out uh, the, 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 the curve and the line in between those data points. Um, but technically, uh, it is not that interesting to use strikes as the x axis uh, or x axis. The, the reason is that um, uh, you will get um, um, a, 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 a skewed view, and I shouldn't be using that word, but you should a, a distorted view um, because of uh, the, the volatility is actually a projection of a certain percentage either, uh, either side. So it's better to actually change the, the x-axis for moneyness. Moneyness, uh, there again, uh, because it's a basic in introduction, um, in, this, um, uh, in this instance, I mean uh, the moneyness as, let's say, a, a mathematical tool or a way to calculate a curve or, or to, and, and to interpret the the IV curve, but I, I checked on the internet what most people, mentors, or whatever experts uh, tend to say about moneyness, and they'll only mention um, uh, it's all about a stride being ITM in the money, or ATM at the money, or OTM out of the money, and it's about extrinsic, intrinsic uh, value of your option. Um, I think it's very much oversimplistic. Uh, and considering that not many traders uh, take their um, position to expiration, um, we, we shouldn't really look at what it means in terms of, uh, I mean, not many traders really look at um, uh, intrinsic, extrinsic value, uh, at least um, waiting for the options to expire. I know a, a, a number of beginners do that, but um, in any case, uh, this is not money net in. Um, in that simple uh, fashion. And, and again, for moneyness to be uh, more symmetrical, we often use the logarithm of x. x is the strike and s is the, the price of the underlying. <clears throat> so we can then uh, um, plot a better looking curve or IV curve. And it will be, because of that, of that symmetry, um, <clears throat> um, it, it I mean, you, you, I will show an example just now, and you will see that it does bring about very interesting properties. I said that I would not touch much about um, horizontal spread, 
but there is a, a adjusting factor that, um, and that, uh, there's no actual um, uh, academic definition of money net, actually. Um, I've read a number of papers, and they, some people will, of course, it's all based on X over S, but some people will adjust, compensate, and do tiny nitty gritty modifications, sometimes just to look good or be different. But anyway, um, something that to me makes sense is actually to multiply it by the square root of time to expiration. And um, it has a, quite an interesting uh, effect on the whole surface calculation. And that's not something I will touch on today, but maybe in the next session or the one after next. Because after introducing the horizontal skew, um, there's a, there's a, there's, there are a number of things that I want to uh, to bring the general understanding of options um, um, into people's mind. But um, uh, we will get to vol surface. I, I mean, this is my my <laughs> almost my passion. But I understand that um, now that I'm starting to introduce and I don't like the word teach because again this is not a course but um, I understand that <laughs> there's a bit of a gap that we need to so we'll go step by step um, something that we need to bring in now um, when we talk about um, vertical skew is uh, a few words on put call parity so put call parity uh, again, a few slides back, there are lots of uh, references on, on, on Google, on the internet, Wikipedia, Investopedia, and it is a formula that looks like that. Basically, put and calls are interrelated, otherwise, and that's the basic uh, premise of um, Black and Scholes, there would be arbitrage opportunities. So, um, a, a lot of people uh, tend to simplify it and say, well, the difference between call, to, call and put uh, prices is equal to the underlying minus minus a strike. The the actual formula is more like exponential of minus RT, or the meaning the risk free rate and T, the time to expiration, times the forward minus the strike. This is this is the more correct uh, approach. But again, when on different sources, different references, you will see different formula, and I understand it sometimes. Um, good enough to simplify and I, I will i will have a session on on put call parity and and uh how it is how, how important it is but the what why why did i introduce put call parity is that in this instance <clears throat> and this uh, screenshot comes from my program so this is a, if this is not today i mean uh, this is a screenshot i did i think last week or um here i plot and my program allows for combining put and call uh, uh, skew curves or, or or plot them separately. But because of put call parity, um, and that's why you can stitch the two curves, because the 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 the, the, the IV on both sides should be more or less the same. Again, because of the the, the important condition of no arbitrage. So this is this is a typical uh, put skew. I mean, of course, is there is there something typical? Uh, the, the 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 graph I showed uh, earlier looked looked more like a, a smirk or a smile, and this one looks pretty straight. So we'll we'll, we'll get to what influences the the shape, but uh, for for now, what is important to understand is that both curves should be able to be stitched, stitched together. So, of course, the, the, there will be a trough here and the, the call skew, but also the put skew. But uh, the put skew far out the money, uh, sorry, far in the money is less interesting. Uh, another thing that is important when you want to uh, model or extract IV out of prices is that you are, of course, very much dependent on um, data quality. And if you are far out of the money, the liquidity is, um, I'm talking about puts, liquidity is small, and so pricing is not so accurate. And if you 
are deep in the money. Again, I'm talking about puts. Um, it should be simpler because although I said it's not something we uh, take too much into account, but uh, I'm saying I'm talking about uh, intrinsic and extrinsic value. But the the other thing that uh, comes into account is um, how amenable market makers are, are about pricing uh, an option properly, accurately. We we cannot ignore that they have their own agenda, they have their own books, own books to balance. And what we see is that even if you have some liquidity, not as bad as far out of the money, the bid ask can be pretty wide. So uh, the mid, which is used to uh, make the calculation, is of course somewhere in the middle. But it doesn't mean that if, and sometimes I have to close a position that uh, with puts which are now some somewhere in the money because the market has shifted down, and uh, you realize that you probably have to give in a little because, um, and it's only when you get an actual execution that you you will know what the, the pricing or the, the the modeling the market makers are are using. But it is it is the, again this is not an exact science. We we're using a framework, and uh, data is what it is for, and it can be, I wouldn't say wrong, but it can, I mean, they can be anomalies, and they can, um, actually more often than not. Uh, so to come back to what I just said, this does not apply for American options. I say, didn't say it is wrong, I said not so true. The thing is that, um, and there will be a session on uh, differences between um, uh, European and American options. Um, we will see what academics say about when it could be interesting or valuable to exercise an option. Let's now have a look at, um, at uh, European options. It's typically, um, I, think, I think it was SPX. Um, and here I use in the x-axis uh, my own moneyness. Again, there's no definite uh, leading formula for this. Um, and here I'm actually not even using the, um, the underlying itself, but the synthetic forward that I calculate. What is important here to notice is that, of course, because there are European options, the two curves, put and call, must be able to be stitched. They should form together something that looks like a smirk or a smile. And here you can see, and that must be um, either a thousand, which curve is this? This is the call. So it's far out of the money calls. The curve seems to be behaving a bit erratically. I mean, they are, uh, of course, pricing issues at both ends. Um, a lot of us are predominantly uh, put options traders. So what is important is, and actually interesting to see, and here I'm only showing two exp expirations, is that um, the, all the way, I mean, I, because it's money less, I can't tell you exactly the price points, but it's probably about 200 points, yeah. Um, what you can see is that uh, on the put side, from near the money to out of the money, um, the, the, the skew or curve is actually fairly flat. Um, it's, I would even think that for many traders and uh, the popular, popular uh, strategies, uh, even though it's an empirical approach, uh, a lot of mentors, experts, don't even go that far into the detail, but it makes sense to choose a strategy where the volatility across strikes is almost predictable. Um, you can more or less figure out, and if you look like here, I've, I've actually plotted a, a simple polynomial, um, it's actually a parabola, uh, degree two poly polynomial fit. You can see that it's 
pretty flat. I mean, this, this factor is next to zero. So whether you do it empirically, if, or you trade by intuition or even trade by simple rules, it's from this perspective, it will always be easier to trade in here on, on the put side, because when you, when you move from one strike to the next or across another strike, the volatility will be fairly predictable. So of course, this is a snapshot taken at a point in time. But of course, if you had a more erratic uh, uh, volatility behavior across the chain, it will, you would put a, well, I don't know, a, a bearish broken butterfly or PCS, and you could have very erratic pricing as well. At least um, it makes our working environment simpler. The other thing that we can notice from this chart is that by using that compensating factor, sigma, which is the IV, ATM IV, and the square root of the time to expiration, and Gary, who's done a lot of work in that field, uh, will confirm and probably add to this, is that, that by uh, using that compensation across expiries, you see that actually the put skew is fairly stable and the, 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 the slope is also similar. So it makes also our life easier when you want to uh, roll over a position to the next month, for example, uh, to know that your, not only your, your, your trade, your position um, is behaving in a, in a way that can be, if not predicted, but with a high level of predictability, and it's gonna be the same when you roll over to the next session and the next and the next. Uh, the, the, the gap between those two expiries is one month in this case. So um, when you analyze SKU, it's actually interesting to be able to plot it in a way that you can um, understand um, some stability in, a, in, in an otherwise pretty mad market. Um, okay, um, now, and this is the something I, I, I plotted from IB earlier today. Now, of course, when you start modeling, and in the previous slide I said, well, in most cases you can use uh, a parabola and for out of the money, it's pretty straight. So you can even actually take it as a straight line. Not always the case. Uh, and even though, for example, at this point, August 2019, um, we have some volatility coming back. We, we understand that, that volatility is coming back pretty close to all time highs. So there is a level of nervousness, which could be unusual, or at least it is definitely not the, the same optimism that we had in 2017 when the market was teasing with uh, all time highs. So it shows, because again, the skew comes from supply and demand. So this is not an anomaly. It is just a market condition that we have to take into account at, to some level. I'm not saying that we need to uh, change the way we trade, but it, it, it probably shows that if IV is higher or the, the concavity, it should be convex or flat. So it shows that there, there are price levels where the level of hedging is higher. So at the moment, I would say that, and it would probably uh, concur with um, an, some analysis that, okay, if we look at IB, um, okay, uh, or, or if, we, if we look at uh, uh, a chart, we would see that we've been in a trading range so more or less people will delta hedge their trade in, in that range. Okay, I mean, uh, there's, there's some nervousness. Maybe we'll have a double top on the 3000 level, almighty level, and the market will drop. But it has already corrected once or twice to once to 27, 25, and recently to 28, 25. So that shows that this, this, that, that can explain 
why there's increased hedging in that area. So uh, I'm not, uh, this is not my intention to mess around and make things more complex than they are, but um, there's always something to read in, in a curve. The, um, and we can see the level of hedging here. And this is specific to uh, this market condition. So as I said, I wanted to make this session short so that we can uh, then discuss. Um, something I've read in, uh, not from a variety of sources is that <clears throat> there are, of course, the people like me, more mathematically inclined, who will try and model uh, through polynomial regression wh what the uh, how the vol is supposed to behave in a large price range. And I would say that it is um, comforting that in most cases it is, it is uh, pretty good. Um, there are some market conditions like now that show, that show, I mean, something slightly different. And some people just don't want to go into any uh, heavy math. And there are a few, I would say, um, some stack type of rules for those who just want to do uh, uh, some quick calculations uh, at the back of an envelope to figure out what volatility is doing. And of course, it's like, it's like a, a technical indicator when you try and figure out what the market is doing. You just uh, simplify uh, some behavior into something simple that will become your benchmark, your gauge. Um, something I've seen is that people do calculate the, your, the, the 25 delta put volatility minus the 25 delta core volatility, they divide it by 50 delta volatility, and they come up with something that for them represents the skew. Um, to me, it's far too local, but again, you know, they, they can be a lot of simpler recipes for those who don't want to do any charting, any graphing, any model. Um, <clears throat> there is a topic um, I will touch on in a, in a future session, um, because it's also something that is, um, I wouldn't say popular, but I mean, I mean something that, that has been around for probably the last 20 years. It's what they call sticky strike or sticky delta and there are some other volatility regimes, sometimes a mix of two. Um, the sticky strike is that when the market moves, is the, the volatility at a strike level staying constant? That would be the sticky strike. So that's something also that you can measure simply. You just uh, look at vol what volatility on a given strike of interest, what it was before the move, is it more or less the same now? Um, and there's a sticky delta, which um, at, at, a, at the same delta before and after the move is volatility the same. Um, the problem theoretically and academically is that um, the sticky start strike rule, um, if it was correct, it would allow for arbitrage opportunities. So it's like a, a virtual circle. It can't be correct because it's against uh, the model. And of course, we use a model to calculate our volatility. Um, and, but generally, generally, again, this, I, I'm, I can appear like a little bit of a nerd or egghead and, and come with far too much math, but I do respect uh, the simpler volatility measures. And of course, they've been around, they've become popular, so they are there for a reason. So a sticky strike, um, and again, coming back to the graph earlier about the, I wouldn't say funny shape, but unusual shape of the vol curve. Sticky strike is um, generally more valid in range trading. Sticky delta is supposed to be more valid in trending markets. So, uh, and again, uh, depending on your time frame and how you, you calculate um, what is a trending market. I mean, it can be visual, of course, but uh, 
technically should be able to be it should be measurable as well but so you you might want to look at sticky strike in a in a range trading market and sticky delta but so I'll, <coughs> I'll have um, that uh, later in um, <coughs> in another session what i also show today is that the different scales and uh, <coughs> uh, here I showed, uh, I mean, IB only shows a strike and volatility. I mentioned that you can use some moneyness and there are different types of uh, formula for, uh, for moneyness and uh, I recommended one. And the same could apply on the Y axis. You can actually use um, the ATM ID as a reference and use a logarithmic scale uh, of, uh, let's say, percentages uh, uh, away from uh, ATM ID. And this also will give you a different um, uh, look and a, a different way. I mean, <clears throat> it's, 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 uh, in mathematics, we're changing dimensions. This is a 2D dim uh, chart. So this is a, a, a plane. So, uh, uh, but by changing dimensions, you you can have a better picture of the the dynamics and behavior of here volatility, and it's actually quite easy to then convert back to the the original dimension. So these these uh, um, uh, bijections or conversions are um, do not impose extra prerequisites or hypothesis. They, they're generally pretty good. It just gives you a better picture. You model them a, a, according to the picture and then you can actually turn them to the original values. Right, that's it. I've talked too much. And since I've got a group of very smart people, it's time to discuss. Gary, I'm sure you've got a lot to say. I mean, you've been working a lot in that, on that field. And I don't have a lot to say about it, but the, the whole deal about the uh, sticky strike, sticky delta, sticky money in this thing, I looked at that w one time, and currently I just, for my personal stuff, I just stick with sticky strike stuff, which is similar to TOS and similar to the EIYO model, and I know it's wrong, but I have some <laughs> comfort in knowing that I'm using something that's very simplistic, but uh, at one time, a couple of years ago, I tried to look into sticky moneyness, which in, in my mind, it seems like that should be more correct than sticky strike. And I, I think I got tangled up in some errors I was making, so I'm kind of uh, abandoned it. But uh, someday I might look at it again, because it seems to be logical, but more logical. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, <clears throat> um, I haven't read a lot on, I mean, it, it does make sense, at least empirically. I mean, in, I, I would have the same intuition. Um, the fact is because there's no um, uh, single definition of money net. I think uh, it has not really gathered momentum, but uh, I fully agree because moneyness will give you <clears throat> a better uh, uh, view on the distribution, so to say, of IV, left and right of the money. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, that's something, if you don't do it, I will definitely look into that, yeah. Yeah, so at some point in time when I, Get a, another head of steam. I might go at it. I, I think I probably I had a typo somewhere or something because my results seemed to be out of whack. And I guess there was a whole lot of computations in it, so I could have had a boo boo anywhere. So just debugging it was kind of a a, 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 a large okay task. But I have uh, seen some people that actually use. A percentage of a uh, uh, sticky strike versus a percentage of I don't know if it's a form of money and it's a form of uh, 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 delta, and they seem to be uh, like uh, Steve Spear I think does that, and he seems to be happy with it. And then somehow that basically kind of 
to me, it seems to imply that like there's some kind of inertia in the IV, which it could be, I don't know. But, uh, but, but it also could be a kind of curve fitting, right? To data you've seen that's, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'd get in trouble going down that. Uh, yeah, but it's also quite exciting, yeah. <clears throat> um, also, as I said, um, um, we do extract IV using model. And by default, when no model is being um, mentioned, it's black and short. Um, and what I've seen in, um, in a few papers, um, and I could mention Emmanuel Derman um, in America, He's a South, South African chap, but nothing to do with my <laughs> attachment to South Africa. Uh, <clears throat> but um, he's, he's more of a Heston guy. Uh, uh, that's something that I don't want to touch on too quickly, but because you know, we're just beginning with Black and Soul. But there are other models. Uh, we know, and especially if we talk about IV uh, volatility in general, we know and understand that um, black and so does not deal well with uh, uh, price jumps. Uh, there have been um, um, modifications, improvements. Uh, if you Google it up, you will just have to look for jump diffusion model. And but there are models that are um, I would say radically different. They don't. They don't try and fix something. They they, they look at it from a, a very different perspective from from day one. Uh, it's I would say it's the Heston family. Um, the same way that we can talk about the Black and Salt family and its uh, multiple variations. And by the way, I mentioned earlier um, uh, the put call parity for European options. Some people think that the Bjergsen Stensland uh, model that is quite often used for American options, they think it's uh, something very different. And no, it's a minor add on to Black and Soul um, just to deal better with the probability of exercising. But it's still the same family and it still suffers from the same weakness, especially when the, the volatility shifts rapidly, drastically, uh, from one day to the next. <clears throat> Heston is, it's not exactly the holy grail either, either but it does the best job at it. And, um, and you will see sticky strike, sticky delta, and as I said, other volatility regimes sometimes being used with other equations. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, we can change, you mentioned sticky money nets, very good idea. And, uh, and I mentioned several possibilities to to plot those curves differently, and there are many more. Um, but of course, the bottom line is your, the, how you calculate IV, and it's of course based on a, a model itself. Yeah. Andrew, you're all silent now. Well, you know what. Um, <laughs> I enjoy this I, because I love learning about it, but to me, it's of extremely limited value as a retail option trader. Um, l l and let me explain why. If you're a market maker, you are... Um, out there putting a bid and an offer price on a whole bunch of options continuously. So you don't choose when or what you trade. So your edge comes from price. Mm -hmm. And if you're a market maker, this is the kind of stuff that is, ex you know, extremely important. Because you have to, you have to get your bid and offer prices correct. Because that's where your entire edge comes from. You know, you're out there putting up a bid and an offer, but it's the, you know, it, 
you don't choose what you trade or when you trade. It's the customers who decide what and when to trade. And that's where their edge comes from. You know, as a retail trader, my edge comes from picking what and when I want to trade. I have to trade at the market maker's price, but I can choose, you know, what options and, and when I want to trade. So, uh, you know, as I said, you know, this is a very limited practical use for me as a, as a retail trader. I enjoy learning about it because I find it fascinating, but it's not really going to help me be a better trader. You know, my, my edge comes from looking at the market and deciding, well, you know, these conditions are, are good for putting on a butterfly or, you know, those conditions, maybe I want to put on a calendar spread. Um, you know, volatility is low right now. So I'm going to, you know, maybe not do anything and, and wait for a, you know, jump in volatility to put something on, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. you know, having, you know, it, it doesn't really help me to get, you know, the, an exact option price for, for each strike because I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not making the market. You know, I, I can, you know, I can choose to trade or not trade if I, if I like the prices or I don't like the prices, but I don't make the prices. You know, the market makers are the ones who are making the prices. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying. And uh, uh, I mean, I would say the vast majority of traders would say the same. So it's actually a very good point. Um, I think if you are, are a, a little bit more advanced, you uh, first it's comforting to see that the, the and of course it probably also um, uh, confirms that uh, uh, empirical approach but it's comforting to see that okay your vault queue seems to be behaving okay and whether i choose to place my broken butterfly or at this level or that level it will have an effect on, on my four usual Greeks, Delta, Vega, Gamma, etc. cetera. Um, and sometimes you will see that, well, price-wise, it may be more interesting. And the change in Greeks will be minimal. And price-wise, it looks like more interesting. So, um, and again, I've, I've got nothing against uh, using your knowledge experience, which I would call empirism uh, or intuition. Yeah. Um, but it, it does try, I mean, what I'm trying to do is to uncover and maybe put words and numbers on intuition. Uh, I, I still believe that when you know more, you trade better. I mean, it has worked on me. Uh, it, I know it works on a number of traders. I mean, if, if you don't want to, if you want to, to, because for your, I mean, I'm not talking about you personally, but for, for anyone's uh, confidence and comfort zone, you don't want to be bothered by uh, things that really look complicated and could confuse me more than anything else. I, 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 I completely, completely understand that. But um, I've seen, um, for example, in uh, Ron Bettino's, uh, uh, community. He makes uh, spreadsheets, for example, to try and figure out where um, the which whatever structure should be better placed. And the the again, I mean, you can choose to put it lower, higher. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's a maybe a tiny edge, but it it is still one. Um, but I. Again, a vast majority will just stick to rules, what they're comfortable with, and I will definitely not deny that the, the self-confidence and feeling strong about your approach is more important than learning new, new things, or it must be done gradually. So you're not wrong, but uh, um, I'm just 
trying or suggesting that um, traders should try and push the envelope a bit further simply because um, it's for me, I mean, Tom is a pilot. To me, it's like flying an airplane and it's all about dealing with emergencies. So if you understand what's going on, <clears throat> there's a um, better chance that you, you'll react uh, more properly. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I am not a big fan of uh, strictly rule-based trading, you know, Delta alert. And <clears throat> I shouldn't say that because the Rhino is meant to be <clears throat> a simple Delta-based uh, strategy. But it's what do you do when things go wrong? And a lot of things have gone wrong in the last three years. Markets have changed completely. I don't know whether it's AI bots or there's something changing the market. And I, my, my, my assumption is that you'd better know the, uh, what's going on under the bonnet. Because uh, simple rule-based trading, the good old days are over, in my view. So <clears throat> of everything I'm presenting, if guys to take 10% of it, at least that's something. Because uh, be sure that in the next, uh, I mean, people who backed it for the last 10 years, to me, it's a waste of time. Uh, it's good for learning, it's good for self-confidence, but markets are changing big time. Um, when I have time, I will try and, uh, and, and, you know, bringing, bring it out as well to show in, in uh, statistical terms what has changed. Um, it can be the skew curses. There is something that is changing. I, I can't really put my finger on it yet, but since Brexit uh, three years ago, and then the presidential elections uh, and the roller coaster since the market is different. Um, and it's also the, the main reason why I'm building my own platform, because I want to be able to trust what's going on. Anyway, we're well, coming to an hour. Yeah, if you have any more questions. Yeah, the, you know, the history of markets is that um, they become, you know, more efficient and edges disappear. Um, I mean, you know, just in the time that I've been doing this, you've seen uh, the iron condors, which were very popular and very profitable for a long time, um, became unprofitable. Um, and now it seems like uh, the age of the kind of butterfly, um, especially rules-based butterfly, that age seems to be over. Uh, exactly. And I don't know what's going to be coming next. I, I, if I look at... Uh, I mean, if you just look at, for example, John Locks, I mean, he's one of the best references. He had his British butterfly, his M3, and then he got technical with uh, the Rock or M21. And now he's into, I don't know, a dozen of different exports to try and, and cover all possible markets, export being more a brokering butterfly strategy. So, <clears throat> Is that fashion or fad, or is it uh, a response to changing markets? Um, it looks like nobody trades the bearish butterfly, or maybe they do because it's so simple. But the M3 comes in all shapes and colors. Um, so I think there's either another form of combo that will suit a majority of traders' uh, risk appetite or in my view, it's gonna be a total mess. And if it's a mess, and with no, um, uh, the, the broken butterfly is still doing okay. Uh, let's not just uh, think, say that things are over. It's just that simple rule-based strategies, um, they don't work, they don't work anymore, yeah. And, um, so either you wait for the next good one or you uh, adapt, you adjust, and that's what I'm doing. 
um, my my rhino is not Brian Larson's original rhino, and even my own rhino has evolved because I, I picked up some weakness on the upside, for example. Um, so I don't know. They, I'm not I'm not a very good designer of a rule based new rule based strategy. I mean, some people are very good at that, um, but for people who tend to trust me and my stuff. Um, I'm, I still try and simplify and keep the number of rules or var var variations um, as simple as possible, but I don't think I will ever get to a simple delta-based uh, strategy anymore. No, the markets are uh, requiring you to be a, you know, a better, smarter trader. Yep. Anyway, I hope this uh, training group uh, uh, will be of interest. Uh, talk about it so that we can uh, we can form a, a bigger and and, and uh, more interesting uh, group. I'm very happy that you joined. I mean, the the, um, the, the we were five or six last week, and uh, and fortunately uh, <laughs> they seem to have been uh, um, a little bit. Uh, Snowed under by the mathematics of it, so, but anyway, yeah, it's not easy to, to, to pitch in the right level. But I'm sure that people who just uh, watch a recording uh, after a while they will get to it. So. Anyway, we now at the now. Uh, so there will be no session next week. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to the normal schedule. So the, the next will be in two weeks' time, and I will cover more about. Uh, Volatility and um, maybe get to more surface. This is one topic here I haven't actually touched at all, and uh, I should have. Is how that those volatility curves change uh, according to time and and um, and volatility, ATM volatility, I and mean, the the shape. Those things we will probably get look into next time. How the vault mine actually shapes up over time, of course, and differently according to the volatile environment. So, more to come next time. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to the silent ones. Thank you, the silent ones, too. And please come back next time.